Chapter Five of Wuthering Heights. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Chapter Five. In the course of time, Mr. Earnshaw began to fail. He had been active and healthy, yet his strength left him suddenly, and when he was confined to the chimney corner, he grew grievously irritable. A nothing vexed him, and suspected slights of his authority nearly threw him into fits. This was especially to be remarked if any one attempted to impose upon or domineer over his favourite. He was painfully jealous lest a word should be spoken amiss to him, seeming to have got into his head the notion that, because he liked Heathcliff, all hated and longed to do him an ill turn. It was a disadvantage to the lad, for the kinder among us did not wish to fret the master, so we humoured his partiality, and that humouring was rich nourishment to the child's pride and black tempers. Still it became in a manner necessary. Twice or thrice Hindley's manifestation of scorn, while his father was near, roused the old man to a fury. He seized his stick to strike him, and shook with rage that he could not do it. At last our curate, we had a curate then who made the living answer by teaching the little Lintons and Earnshaws, and farming his bit of land himself, advised that the young man should be sent to college. And Mr. Earnshaw agreed, though with a heavy spirit, for he said, Hindley was naught, and would never thrive as where he wandered. I hoped heartily we should have peace now. It hurt me to think the master should be made uncomfortable by his own good deed. I fancied the discontent of age and disease arose from his family disagreements, as he would have it that it did. Really, you know, sir, it was in his sinking frame. We might have got on tolerably notwithstanding but for two people, Miss Cathy and Joseph the servant. You saw him, I dare say, up yonder. He was, and is yet most likely, the wearisomest, self-righteous Pharisee that ever ransacked a Bible to rake the promises to himself and fling the curses to his neighbours. By his knack of sermonising and pious discoursing, he contrived to make a great impression on Mr. Earnshaw. And the more feeble the master became, the more influence he gained. He was relentless in worrying him about his soul's concerns, and about ruling his children rigidly. He encouraged him to regard Hindley as a reprobate, and night after night he regularly grumbled out a long string of tales against Heathcliff and Catherine, always minding to flatter Earnshaw's weakness by heaping the heaviest blame on the latter. Certainly she had ways with her such as I never saw a child take up before, and she put all of us past our patients fifty times and oftener in a day. From the hour she came downstairs till the hour she went to bed, we had not a minute's security that she wouldn't be in mischief. Her spirits were always at high water mark, her tongue always going, singing, laughing, and plaguing everybody who would not do the same. A wild, wicked slip she was, but she had the bonniest eye, the sweetest smile, and lightest foot in the parish, and after all, I believe she meant no harm. For when once she made you cry in good earnest, it seldom happened that she would not keep you company, and oblige you to be quiet that you might comfort her. She was much too fond of Heathcliff. The greatest punishment we could invent for her was to keep her separate from him. Yet she got chided more than any of us on his account. 
In play she liked exceedingly to act the little mistress, using her hands freely, and commanding her companions. She did so to me, but I would not bear slapping and ordering, and so I let her know. Now, Mr. Earnshaw did not understand jokes from his children. He had always been strict and grave with them, and Catherine, on her part, had no idea why her father should be crosser and less patient in his ailing condition than he was in his prime. His peevish reproofs wakened in her a naughty delight to provoke him. She was never so happy as when we were all scolding her at once, and she defying us with her bold, saucy look and her ready words, turning Joseph's religious curses into ridicule, baiting me, and doing just what her father hated most, showing how her pretended insolence, which he thought real, had more power over Heathcliff than his kindness how the boy would do her bidding in anything, and his only when it suited his own inclination. After behaving as badly as possible all day, she sometimes came fondling to make it up at night. "'Nay, Cathy,' the old man would say, "'I cannot love thee, thou art worse than thy brother. Go say thy prayers, child, and ask God's pardon.' I doubt thy mother and I must rue that we ever reared thee. That made her cry at first, and then, being repulsed continually, hardened her, and she laughed if I told her to say she was sorry for her faults and begged to be forgiven. But the hour came at last that ended Mr. Earnshaw's troubles on earth. He died quietly in his chair one October evening, "'seated by the fireside. "'A high wind blustered round the house "'and roared in the chimney. "'It sounded wild and stormy, "'yet it was not cold and we were all together, "'I a little removed from the hearth busy at my knitting, "'and Joseph reading his Bible near the table, "'for the servants generally sat in the house then "'after their work was done.' Miss Cathy had been sick, and that made her still. She leant against her father's knee, and Heathcliff was lying on the floor with his head in her lap. I remember the master, before he fell into a doze, stroking her bonny hair. It pleased him rarely to see her gentle, and saying, "'Why canst thou not always be a good lass, Cathy?' and she turned her face up to his, and laughed, and answered, "'Why cannot you always be a good man, father?' But as soon as she saw him vexed again, she kissed his hand, and said she would sing him to sleep. She began singing very low, till his fingers dropped from hers, and his head sank on his breast. Then I told her to hush and not stir, for fear she would wake him. We all kept as mute as mice a full half-hour, and should have done so longer, only Joseph, having finished his chapter, got up and said that he must rouse the master for prayers and bed. He stepped forward and called him by name, and touched his shoulder, but he would not move. So he took the candle and looked at him. I thought there was something wrong as he set down the light, and, seizing the children each by an arm, whispered them to frame upstairs and make little din. They might pray alone that evening. He had summit to do. "'I shall bid father good-night first, said Catherine, putting her arms round his neck before we could hinder her. The poor thing discovered her loss directly. She screamed out, "'Oh, he's dead! Heathcliff, he's dead!' And they both set up a heart-breaking cry. I joined my wail to theirs, loud and bitter, but Joseph asked what we could be thinking of to roar in that way over a saint in heaven. 
he told me to put on my cloak and run to Gimmerton for the doctor and the parson. I could not guess the use that either would be of then. However, I went, through wind and rain, and brought one, the doctor, back with me. The other said he would come in the morning. Leaving Joseph to explain matters, I ran to the children's room. Their door was ajar. I saw they had never lain down, though it was past midnight. But they were calmer, and did not need me to console them. The little souls were comforting each other with better thoughts than I could have hit on. No parson in the world ever pictured heaven so beautifully as they did in their innocent talk. And while I sobbed and listened, I could not help wishing we were all there, safe together. End of chapter 5 Recording by Ruth Golding